So, are you a no drama person? Come on, look at me. We're turning up the heat. Super, super hot. And having a blast. There's something like sexy. Whoa. It's the hottest show on YouTube. You have excellent taste. Ladies and gentlemen. With the conversations you want to listen to. Do you feel like you've been deep in love before? <laughs> you won't find a lineup like this anywhere else. You're being controversial out of the gate. <laughs> I love it. You never know who you're going to see. That was like, whoa. Or what they will say. You have to roll the dice. Oh, baby. Hey, good people. Welcome to the latest and greatest edition of the Carlos Watson Show. And we got a good one for you today. We're showing up big. We got a titan of music, an icon of sound, legend in the business. Of course, I'm talking about Tommy Mottola. Now, you know him as the chairman and CEO of Sony Music Entertainment, where he broke the likes of Mariah Carey, Celine Dion, Hall & Oates, Destiny's Child, Jessica Simpson, Dixie Chicks, and more bolstered careers like Barbara Streisand, Bruce Springsteen, and Billy Joel. And of course, many say he's responsible for the Latin explosion in the 1990s. I'm talking J-Lo, Ricky Martin, Mark Anthony, and a whole lot more. Look, dude's a legend, and Tommy Mottola was good enough to stop by. Very candid conversation. To have the ability to work with the most talented people in the world. I would wake up sometimes and pinch myself. Why do you think you made it? I knew what I didn't know. You've had in your career more young black executives than I had realized had kind of grown up under you. In my whole career, that was a lot of the way that I gravitated. Rumor has it that you've been in a music video. I knew you'd pull this card out. Here we go. I was Santa Claus, so. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey, Tommy. Ozzy's in the building. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Where are you? Uh, I'm in actually in uh, Connecticut. We moved out of the city. I, you know, lived and worked there my whole life. But we have little kids, so they go to school up here. Tommy, were your parents in music, so, or 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 were you the first one to break into music? Uh, my father was a customs broker, but there was always music in my house. Uh, they loved music. He would, he was an amateur like piano, ukulele player, uh, and my sisters would sing. My mother was a frustrated singer. She always wanted to be a singer. It was a constant, you know, atmosphere and an environment of music. And I was raised with it. And and you know, started playing instruments at a very early age. And, and did you did you think, like if I had met you in high school, did you think you were gonna make a career out of music? In high school, I was obsessed with becoming a star. <laughs> you know? And I started as a trumpet player of all instruments, but it wasn't cool. And so, you know, I took up the guitar and I joined a band, I joined, joined the band that was like the hot band at the time uh, in our area. There were two bands. There was us, which was the Exotics, and there was the Young Rascals, who, and obviously, they were the ones that became famous. One, two, three! And so we played, you know, all the local country clubs, the churches, the dances, everything. And it was an amazing, amazing uh, way to sort of get my PhD in music. How did you go from musician to business person? Uh, at an early age, I knew I was going to be aligned with music or show business somehow. I had also uh, taken acting classes and I did some minor roles in movies, you know, like as an extra, you know, like, look at the bird. You know, th that was my one big line. Uh, <laughs> it was in a movie with uh, Mary Tyler Moore, you know, which, um, so, you know, sitting on a set, all day long to say one line made me realize right away, I don't know about this, right? I'm waiting outside people's offices for hours and hours to audition as a singer or a musician also was making me scratch my head saying, I think you might be on the wrong end of this kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So I decided to get a job as a music publisher. I took my first job as a music publisher. And who was your first star? Paul and Oates. 
I mean, they, they played me songs that were just so brilliant and their singing and their style together was so special and so unique. When in your career did you really take off, Tommy? What was the moment? It came in stages. Um, I worked early on, you know, again with Hall & Oates, which then they became huge international stars, right? So that was a major platform for them and for me. You know, the entree that you get as a result of that globally, not just in the U.S., is, is huge. And then working with Diana Ross on some music at that time, having friends uh, in the movie business, uh, a dear friend of mine named Joe Pesci. <laughs> and through Joe, I met Bob De Niro, and that alliance happened. So my interest in film really, you know, really took off at that time and, you know, was able to use all these contacts and all of the things that were going on, you know, in a good way in music to really put it all together. I had an amazing opportunity and journey to work with people from the very beginning, like Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, Michael Jackson, Barbra Streisand, Tony Bennett, Aerosmith, um, you know, the classical acts, all of the country artists, all of the Latin acts, you know, Julio Iglesias, Destiny's Child, and then Beyonce emerged, and J-Lo, and Mark Anthony, and Ricky Martin, and Shakira, you know, and Mariah, and on and on and on. So it was a real blessing um, to have the ability to work with the most talented people in the world. I mean, I would wake up sometimes and pinch myself. And you also, you've had in your career more young black executives than I had realized had kind of grown up under you. Was that purposeful? Was that accidental? First of all, my passion you know, was, was R&B music. You know, I remember, I forget how I got some ID, but I, I got in, into the Apollo Theater to go see Stevie Wonder perform Fingertips for the very first time. Oh, Stevie Wonder! <laughs> Or James Brown. I mean, I looked at James Brown. I, I thought it was wasn't real. Are you ready for the night train? So we were so into James Brown, my whole crew of musicians and friends. I mean, I would go, I remember in the school bathroom and imitate it, you know, because you had a great echo. You know, so it, in my whole career, that was a, a lot of the way that I gravitated, you know. And young executives at Sony, um, there, there was a tremendous, uh, for me, a tremendous opportunity to bring in diversity, you know. Uh, and we work closely with a lot of the community groups and National Action Network and different, different people to, to really strive to really have, you know, have the best of diversity. We can do it! We can do it! I believe in you! We can do it! Faster! The Our Home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. You know, it's interesting, um, Tommy, because your route, going from very successful manager of talent to someone who's running a multi-billion dollar business. Number of people have tried that. Why do you think you made it? The simple answer to that is, I knew what I didn't know. So I brought in people who were much more experienced and much more knowledgeable than me as my team to surround me, to be able to help me navigate through all those things. And not only did that become the strongest team in the industry, but of course, you know, I'm a good learner. So, you know, I was, a, I, I was in there night and day as a student, eating 
drinking, sleeping, the whole process. And within a few years, it was very fluid to me. So I had this team around me knowing and recognizing that if I did not have this, I would fail. What I did know is I knew hit songs, how to make hit records, and how to get them on the radio, and how to make them successful. I love that you had that humility in there to kind of see that and know that in that way. I love to surround myself with people who know more than me about anything that I am entering into and doing. Your biggest failure ever? Being overambitious and overdriven and um, neglecting to be, uh, I guess, to be as good a father as I could have been uh, with my first two children. You, you feel like you're, you're, you're learning from that as you, with your two younger children? Um, <laughs> I, I never thought at this point in life I'd be the guy driving at 7 a.m. to school. You know? <laughs> I thought it'd be supposed to be on the yacht with the cigar and the, uh, and the scotch, but I'm the guy that does that sometimes. And I am doing everything in my power to, uh, to make up for that uh, with my older children and my younger children, yeah. Lots of people dream. Not everyone dreams fearlessly. Not everyone brings the dreams alive. Best advice you'd give on dreaming fearlessly? Everybody's got their same standard, you know, statement back to that. I mean, the bottom line is when you know you have something, when you believe in it, you do it as relentlessly as necessary to go there and to get it done. And if you fail, go do it again. It doesn't matter. Or come up with another idea. If you are ambitious and you believe, and you believe that you can accomplish things, anything, anything great or anything small, you just keep doing it as relentlessly as possible without hurting people and try to get it done. Tommy, tell me a little bit about Entertain. Why did you decide to do this at this point and in this way? We started Entertain because this giant hole in the market exists for a company that can take our culture, and I say our culture, because it's part of my DNA, being raised with it, being involved in the Latin explosion, and being married 22 years to my beautiful Mexican wife. It is absolutely part of my DNA. But take, so taking our culture and putting a company out there that would give us authenticity to create amazing content for television, film, or whether we do marketing or advertising or endorsements or every aspect of, of what goes on in the spectrum, there's a huge hole in the marketplace. We've been working on for the last year, half a dozen shows or more that were in pre-development and now they're all going to market and it's, it's going wild. Everybody wants to buy the shows. And so it will represent, in my opinion, you know, the real Latin culture, because it is centered in urban music and our access to, to not only the Latin demographic, right? And the numbers show how far the reach is. And all we have to do is look at the charts and look at, you know, J Balvin or Bad Bunny or what's happening. They're bigger than anything or anybody in the world. So that shows you the reach. It's global music. It's not Latin music, it's global music. You know what that means to me? We are now pop culture. I love that. Um, Tommy, as we wrap up, you mind if I do a little rapid fire with you? Go ahead. Uh, your favorite book of all time? Machiavelli. <laughs> oh, nice one. All right. Finally, Tommy, rumor has it uh, that you've been in a music video before. Now, I know I knew that you had sung, but I didn't know that you'd been in a music video. Have you been in a music video before? And if so, which one? Okay, so I knew you'd pull this card out. Here we go. Um, I've been in two, 
actually. Um, I was actually in a Hall & Oates video uh, on a song called Jingle Bell Rock where I was Santa Claus. Oh. But the biggest one, of course, was All I Want for Christmas, um, and I was Santa Claus. I was the guy, you know, there wasn't a Santa Claus around that day. We were up in a house that I had had upstate where we shot the video, and um, so I was the guy relegated to play Santa Claus. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, and that, you know, that that album and that song has become, I mean, it's become the biggest Christmas song of all time, you know, bigger than White Christmas. And it, it, I'm really proud of that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm so happy for her to have achieved that, you know, that number one spot. It was number one when we released it. It sold over three million copies in Japan. I mean, they don't even celebrate Christmas. So it goes to show you the power uh, of, of something like that. She was not in favor of doing the Christmas album. And I can totally understand. She was a young kid and it was like Christmas albums. What are you talking about? I want to be, I want to do hip hop. Don't you get it, man? You know, and I said, yes, but every classic star that I grew up with in the spectrum of people who were around forever and became iconic, always had a Christmas album in their repertoire. You're going to become that biggest star. You got to do a Christmas album. Anyway, it was a struggle. Long story short, she did the Christmas album, right? And, um, you know, it was... When you listen to that record, you know, I don't think you could ever recreate another or a better one from there. Uh, and so we were shooting the video and she had this hair and makeup people make her look kind of retro. And she had to go outside. I, I got real reindeer, like real live reindeer. And so she's looking at the pictures and everything. She said, you're trying to turn me into Connie Francis. And I said, and we had like a little, we had words. But then I turned to myself and I said, how the hell does she even know who Connie Francis is, right? Yeah, she's having quite the comeback. Hey, Tommy, yeah. it was a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Not all, real pleasure. Thank you for joining okay. me. Thank you, Carlos. Let's get into it. It was cool hearing the history of uh, you know all the music that I grew up you know 90s pop that's like that was on the radio all the time in my childhood so knowing that he was kind of in the midst of that was very cool for me. yeah good good we got to peek a little into like the mastermind of a, in an empire you know mm -hmm. the philosophies that I heard heard him unravel on how he got through doing things. That was dope. It was kind of cool to hear that. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Tommy. What a rare opportunity to talk to someone who's helped launch that many stars, been a part of that many big conversations and that kind of growth. It was interesting to hear him give as much credit as he did to the Bronx. You know, so interesting to hear his career start as a manager and see it evolve from there. And appreciated that there was some humility about maybe some of the things that didn't quite go according to the plan or that maybe he could have done better or different. All right, listen, my thanks to Tommy and all of you for tuning in. Uh, please remember you can always like and subscribe to the show and you'll see more episodes every day. Of course, you got the podcast, all kinds of fire in that. Be safe, be well. We'll see you on the other side. Yes.